Okay, so welcome all for uh, joining our, our course this, uh, this fall in uh, looking at exposure response modeling of categorical count and time to event data uh, using, uh, using Bayesian methods, uh, wind bugs in particular. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, let me uh, get you oriented to things today. In fact, most of today we'll spend on sort of a course introduction talking a bit about the what we're going to be doing in the course and some of the tools that you'll be using uh, and uh, probably spend a relatively short time on sort of an initial introduction uh, to some of the concepts that we'll be working with. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. Uh, so uh, my intention here then is to provide an introduction to modeling of categorical count and time to event data. Uh, as well as the use of wind bugs for those types of applications. Though I, I will, for most of the examples we'll go through here, um, or at least most of our hands-on examples, I'll also, though I won't actually run them in non-MEM, I'll also provide you with some example non-MEM control scripts for, for most of those. Uh, the course duration and the content we feel is equivalent to a single semester two-credit course at a, at a typical uh, institution of higher learning and for each week um, we'll we'll have a one-hour lecture on Monday followed by a what will usually be a hands-on lab uh, of one hour on Thursday uh, and though in many cases I'll actually have the lecture will probably bleed over into uh, into that hands-on period too uh, so I guess down below in the bullets, I'm just reiterating that. So lectures are at 2 on Mondays, uh, and the hands-on labs are at Thursdays also at 2. Uh, I guess one thing, maybe even digging through here, you've already gotten, at least some of you have already got a sense of uh, of the setup we have using GoToMeeting. Uh, you can, we won't actually have any verbal Q&A uh, using this, uh, but we can do Q&A using the question section uh, of the uh, go to go to where actually it's go to webinar, I guess, control panel here. And I see some of you have already made use of that here as we were trying to get things uh, working here. So that that will be our, our primary means for communication then. Uh, during this. In addition, uh, there we'll talk about our course website that provides forums uh, that you can use for interactions. And if there are things that you want to send me directly and not through the forum, feel free to, to send emails. And I'd be glad to respond to those also. Uh, so start out with, let's see, did I skip a slide here? Nope. Uh, so for those of you who are going to be uh, expecting a certificate uh, for completing this course, uh, this describes the expectations around that. Uh, so all students are expected to attempt the hands-on exercises prior to the Thursday lab. Uh, we won't actually be grading that homework, but uh, that's primarily what we'll be doing in Thursdays, which we'll be reviewing solutions. Uh, for for any of the hands-on exercises. Uh, there will be a midterm take-home exam that will be assigned at the midpoint of the course and then there'll be a final take-home assigned at the end of the course uh, and it'll be due a week after it's posted. Uh, in addition, students will be required to complete and submit a modeling project before the end of the course and that'll be based on some either real world or or, or I say, or a similar problem. In other words, if you don't have actual data for a suitable real-world problem, it's it's acceptable to use simulated data, uh, and that should include components of things like data assembly, model development, and evaluation, uh, and a brief report. And uh, I'll provide more details of that later as we get closer to uh, to the time where uh, where you should uh, get that underway. Uh, and then the course grade in the end will be based upon a combination of those three items with 25% uh, going to each of the midterm and final exams and 50% to the modeling project. Uh, I think most of you have already seen uh, the, our, our course website and uh, 
and you've probably accessed at least to sign up for the course, but you may not have looked at the actual course content uh, that we've got posted there. Uh, so you, you do have an account to access uh, that website, uh, and I've got the link posted there, as you can see. Uh, and in addition, postings to that site uh, will generally automate, you know, generate an email message that will go to your email account so you'll know when uh, new items have been posted there. Uh, actually, I just realized I know that's true for the forums. Joe, is that also true for other content? I suspect that may only be true. Okay, Joe said no. I suspect the, there might be a subscription thing available there, but I'm not sure. I'd have to take a look. Oops, pushed the wrong button. Oh, Joe said no on that too. Okay. Only forums. Okay. Uh, so, but anyway, the site uh, will be a repository for uh, a lot of our course resources. Uh, and so, and it does include some forums that, that you can subscribe to and get emails so that uh, you know when new materials have been there. So, for example, there's a news forum there where I'll, where I'll tend to put updates about class schedule and so on. Uh, and then we've got, uh, there's a more general discussion forum uh, where you can direct questions about course content uh, to the instructors or, or to other students. Uh, and you can contribute to any ongoing discussions there, or if you like, you can start a new thread. Uh, there's also a technical support forum there that if you've got particular problems you've encountered and using any of our, uh, any of our, our web resources in there, uh, please post a, you know, post a description of the problem there so that we can follow up on that. Uh, you'll see uh, there's also a link to this, uh, to our well to the go to webinar webcast registration form but you've already obviously done that if you're uh, if you're talking to me now and then finally I've got some course materials posted there actually let's go ahead and take a look at, at what's there uh, let me go over there Oops. Let's take a peek okay here's the uh, uh, our main page then for uh, for the MI 255 course so you can see in here we've got the forums I mentioned here, the news forum, uh, the Q&A forum, and our technical support forum. So for example, you can go into one of these, like uh, say the news forum, because I think that's the only one that has any content in it. And you can see you've got, there's uh, various things in here, you know, like you would probably already received an email today here uh, that that mirrored what you see right here. Uh, where I was telling you that some of the course slides are already posted there, for example. Uh, let's go back up here. It looks like Joe posted something here. I guess just a reminder that the first class is starting. Uh, and then we've got our Q&A forum and our technical support forum. It looks like there's one post there already. What's that? Oh, okay. Uh, curiosity, has he found his way in it? Uh, if you haven't already, Joe, you might want to respond to that one. Since I don't want to do that while I'm running the course. I already did. Okay, good. Uh, let's go back up to the course site here. Uh, well, we won't worry about the webinar registration. You're already set there. Um, let me point you down to these first before we talk about the um, the Windows environment we'll be working with. Uh, the course handout is posted here, and by the way, if you happen to grab one before noon, I did make a few relatively minor changes uh, to it right around noon, uh, so you may end up wanting to upload the more uh, the more recent one there. Uh, in addition, well, actually, let me before I talk about the next one, let me talk about this. Uh, in fact, let me go back to the slides to talk about this, and then we'll come back to uh, to the site here. Okay, let me go. Uh, there, to do the hands-on problems here, there's a, a couple of approaches uh, that you can uh, that you can use. Uh, the one that uh, that we're recommending. Uh, here, um, let me see. 
Okay, I'll deal with that later here. Um, there's a couple ways that you can do the hands-on exercises. Uh, one of the ways here is we provide access to a compute server. Uh, this is actually out on the Amazon cloud. Uh, and uh, you should have already received an email with a username and password uh, for that particular server. Uh, you can access it using uh, the remote desktop connection uh, app in, uh, in Windows or, or Macs. Uh, and there's a couple other approaches you can use in, in other environments. Uh, and you can use it to connect to, to that site, which is listed here. You can see, whoops, uh, comp2metrominstitute.org. Uh, comment here that we'll talk about in more detail, uh, probably on Thursday, I think, uh, is how to set up a, a shared folder to allow you to exchange files between the server and your own computer. You can either exchange things that way or using FTP, but uh, using uh, a shared folder is probably the easiest way of doing it. Uh, and, and, and you'll find that in the setup there that R and WinBugs are already installed. Uh, and, and in addition, your user folder there contains uh, the initial course materials. So you're pretty much already set to go if you, if you access that. Uh, just to illustrate that real quickly without going into a lot of detail, let me just show you the process here. For example, this is from a Mac. It'll look a little bit different if you're coming at it from Windows. Uh, in the case of a Windows environment, you usually find remote desktop connection uh, under the accessories component. So if you bring up the start menu, go to accessories, and usually remote desktop is someplace in that. Uh, here on the Mac here, let me go ahead and fire up the, the Mac version of that. Uh, you can see I've got it set up uh, to go to comp2metrominstitute.org. And when I connect, it asks me a few annoying questions and finally lets us through. Okay, and it fires up a, a window then uh, where I'm now looking at a um, at a window at a server operating. I think it's Windows Server 2008 or some such flavor of that of Windows Server. Uh, let me go ahead and make that bigger here. Let's go to full screen so you can see it. Uh, so you can see things like you've got a uh, you can fire up uh, fire up R here. So so you've got that that you can use. At. Um, in addition, we've got WinBug set up, so you can fire that up. And if you go to and pull up the uh, uh, the Windows ex the uh, the Windows Explorer here, and look at computer. Uh, the main thing I'm looking at here is if you go and look at the user, your user files, and here I'll get to it from C here. So you go to C down to uh, users. Uh, you'll see here a list of, uh, excuse me, got a, a list of file or a list of folders here. You can see with various abbreviated versions of your names in here. Uh, and inside those you'll find various things, but I've actually got more folders than, than you do to start with, but the key folder of interest here is this one right here, uh, the MI255 folder. Uh, if you go down into that, uh, you'll see a list, for instance, of various examples. Uh, you've got some folders for our various hands-on exercises that we have here, as well as a copy of the handout, although that's actually the earlier version. Um, of it, so again, you may. Uh, in general, what you'll find is that as I go along, I'll probably be adding to the slides and handouts over the course of the course, uh, and so I generally recommend that you check in prior to the class uh, to get whatever the most recent uh, recent version of that is. Okay, let me f close that up again. So, well, I guess I maybe I'll open that back up briefly here. Uh, and again, on Thursday, I'll show you how to do it. But uh, the way I've got this set up on mine, for example, is I can actually access one of my local folders uh, on my Mac in this case. 
so I can actually look at this. This MI255 folder here actually happens to be sitting on my Mac, and I can copy folders back and you know copy files and folders back and forth from that to the uh, to the server. So again, that's probably the easiest way of doing it. And uh, on Thursday, I'll show you how to set that up. Okay, but once you're, if for those of you who haven't regularly haven't used remote desktop, you'll find it's basically just like working directly on a on a Windows machine, maybe a little bit slower sometimes. Why did I open that up? I wanted to log off. There we go. Okay, so that was the uh, the environment there. Um, as I say, if most of you are probably working in Windows already. And uh, so you'll have remote desktop already on the machine. Um, it's just taking you this link here. Uh, this is just commenting here on on what I just said about Windows. So there, you've already got it on the Mac. Uh, actually, this was recommending Cord. This was an older link, I think. The uh, Cord doesn't have as nice a setup as far as doing the file folder. Um, the file sharing so actually I'm not going to recommend Cord uh, for now right now I'm, I think we're better off using the uh, remote desktop uh, for the work here uh, and then if you happen to be working on some other flavor of Unix here uh, there are probably some other clients out there in particular this mentions the R desktop which is available for a few different flavors of Unix So that's using um, using that um, the cloud server, uh, but if you prefer to work locally uh, at your own machine, I give you the tools uh, necessary for that. And in particular, I give it to you in a way that doesn't require you to install the software on your own machine. I know we've sometimes run into problems where uh, people are unable to install software because of some restrictions they have on their company. Uh, company computers and such so the strategy that I that I suggest is you actually install the software on a flash drive on a USB drive and you actually do the coursework right on that drive uh, and the means for doing that is right here where you see mi255 usb.zip okay that's a zip file that contains the initial course materials just like we were looking at uh, on the uh, on the cloud server and so what you would do is you'd have to download that and warning it's fairly large it's like 45 megabytes so it takes a little while to download uh, but you can download that and then uh, we'll see there's a slide that will come to shortly that describes the process then of creating a USB flash drive that will contain the software and other course materials for doing the course. So again, that's that's another strategy you can use for, for doing the course exercises. Okay, so, okay, we mentioned all that. Okay, so, and this is what, uh, again, the idea of using your own computer. Uh, so again, all the materials are in that MI255 USB.zip file. And if that's the way you want to work, then uh, what you can do here is to install that on a USB drive. Just go through the steps that are here, which just basically say download it, unzip it. Uh, that's going to create a folder called MI255 USB. Uh, take a, a flash drive, preferably an empty one that has a capacity of a gigabyte or more. Copy the contents of MI255 USB. And notice I say the contents of it, not the folder itself. Uh, copy that to the flash drive, and at that point you will have a uh, flash drive then suitable for, for running the coursework. Uh, you can, it, to check it, go ahead, and there's a couple of shortcuts there. One called, you can see they both end in .cmd, one for the R. Uh, program and one for WinBugs. Go ahead and launch those and you know double click on them and make sure they actually launch the software. Uh, if that doesn't work then uh, let us know. Report it on that uh, technical support forum. Okay. Let's 
move on. Let's take a look at uh, what we'll be talking about this semester. Uh, and this was just kind of a, uh, a com general comment on it. Uh, the outline that's here is one that was originally developed for a two-day, you know, all-day workshop. And, and we will be covering all of the topics that are listed there, as well as all of the examples. But uh, I'm asking you to anticipate some changes uh, to allow the course to better fit this one semester webcast format. So you may find that uh, in some cases I may reorder the topics a bit, maybe subdivide some of the uh, hands-on uh, exercises into subtasks that might get split over more than one week uh, as part of it. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, when it gets stretched out like this, I often find I can add some additional topics and, and examples. So that's uh, that's a possibility here. So, what are we going to talk about? Uh, of course, we already said we, I want to give you an introduction to modeling of categorical count and time to event data, uh, and we're going to be using WinBugs for doing that. Uh, what the primary intended audience here uh, is, as I say, pharmacometricians with biological or statistical modeling skills. Uh, I'm assuming that you have uh, PKPD or statistical modeling. Uh, experience uh, and that you're familiar and have some hands-on experience with nonlinear regression, mixed effects modeling, and Bayesian modeling using WinBugs, and that you're also familiar with R or perhaps S+, uh, so that you've got a core understanding uh, of the, the components we're going to be working with, and we're going to build on that. And then uh, general outline, uh, we're going to be, I'll start out today with some you know, fairly general theory and background, uh, talking about viewing modeling from a more probabilistic point of view uh, and focusing particularly on the likelihood function, uh, talk a little bit about maximum likelihood for continuous data, continuous data, and then saying, okay, now how do we translate that notion to uh, to to extend it to well as I term here odd type data and I won't take uh, if well if you like that's something of an homage I guess to Stuart Beale uh, he's the one he's the person I'm aware who's get, used that term and perhaps coined it uh, uh, Stuart referred to things like categorical count and uh, and time to event you know sensor data is all falling under the heading of what he called odd type data. Uh, so that's kind of my shorthand rather than saying categorical count and time to event every time. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about hierarchical, or in other words, mixed effects modeling of longitudinal odd type data. And then finally, taking that and translating that into a Bayesian framework to talk about Bayesian modeling of odd type data. Uh, then we'll talk specifically about modeling some different data types and starting out with binary data and introducing uh, the notion of logistic regression models. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, and talk about, okay, and with, in the context of logistic regression, we have Bernoulli models for individual binary data and binomial models in the case where we have summary data. In other words, uh, where we have like the number or fraction of uh, let's say number of fraction or, or of patients who experience a particular event, for example, rather than simply looking at binary data for an individual, and that would be described by a binomial model. Uh, and then finally, how do you extend those to a mixed effects context when we're dealing with longitudinal uh, binary data? Uh, I'll get your first get into your first hands-on problem at that point, which will be looking at some logistic regression for binary data, and then talk about uh, model evaluation. In particular, I'm going to focus at that point on uh, what I term here simulation-based methods for dealing with categorical data. I'll assume you've probably already been exposed to a lot of methods for dealing with continuous data, and then here we want to talk about things that are more unique to the categorical data situation. Uh, then we'll talk about longitudinal binary data where we're getting into mixed effects modeling and then getting into ordinal data, in other words, ordered categorical data uh, and talking about cumulative logit models for working with that. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, 
problem we worked with at one point where we actually compared uh, the performance of using approximate maximum likelihood methods like the uh, non mem Laplace method versus using MCMC. Uh, then we move on to a, a hands-on problem in longitudinal ordinal data. Uh, then we finally get on to count data where we'll talk about the basic Poisson model and variations on that to deal with what are termed over dispersion or zero inflation. Uh, and then we'll have a hands-on problem there and then finally get into time to event data. Uh, initially just looking at the case where we're looking at the time to a single event in each individual uh, and to do that we'll get into the whole notion of survival analysis for dealing with censored data uh, and we'll get into the various principles and methods for that and then talk about uh, well then oh, first I guess we'll have a hands-on example in that and then talk about for dealing with difficult more difficult problems due to things like having a time barrier time varying hazard function uh, we'll talk about repeated time to event data uh, and uh, to model that uh, and then our the hands-on problem six will be a repeated time to event data problem and a closing discussion. Now as I say, as I adapt this to uh, to this one semester context, I suspect we're going to actually have a little bit more time to maybe cover either some of these areas either in more detail than I have in the on-site courses or we might extend to uh, to other problems. Uh, one area I was hoping to extend this to that I may take a look at will be things like uh, maybe going into some uh, other topics than the ones I have here. A couple that might be interesting might be to extend into things like hidden Markov models uh, is one area. Another one is there's been some interesting recent work on the combined analysis of uh, time to event data coupled with event magnitude. So for example, instead of say just modeling the time to a particular event like maybe say in a particular category of adverse event, you might in addition also be modeling the severity of that adverse event and how can you do combined analysis of those two types of data. Uh, anyway, there's some uh, some interesting literature on that out there. So that's those are a couple things that we might have time to extend into. Okay, let me take a quick breath here, uh, see if before I actually start digging into a little bit of material here, uh, any, you know, any comments or, or questions uh, that you might have there. Let's see, so far nothing new popping up. If you happen to still be typing, go ahead and continue here. I'll try and keep my eye open to see if uh, if something pops up here. So what I was going to uh, go on to here is to just start out with some fairly general theory and background. Um, and uh, and now this is we're going to start out fairly basic, so I apologize to those for whom this is maybe all too familiar territory. Uh, this will be particularly true for any of you, anybody in the group who uh, whose primary training was in statistics. Uh, but these days, uh, uh, the people who come through a more biological modeling side of things are getting more sophisticated in this stuff too. So, so uh, I guess I'll apologize beforehand if this is a little too basic and boring. Uh, but I think it's worth taking a quick walk through. Um, and the first part here, this first uh, note here, is actually more of a uh, something of an aside, I guess. Here, but it, just commenting that you know, when well, I know when I came into into modeling, you know, I came through uh, from the pharmacy side of the house originally, 
Uh, and when I first got exposed to modeling, I tended to view most of the models from a pretty deterministic point of view. Uh, and, and things like variability and uncertainty and the statistical tools that were required to deal with variability and uncertainty were things that, okay, I knew I had to use them. You know, as I say here, they were sort of obligatory nuisances to deal with noise, but I didn't see them as the focus of the modeling problem. I saw them just as tools to deal with those nuisances, if you like. Uh, and that sort of began to turn around as as I started to get increasingly involved in the use of uh, mixed effects modeling where the probability distributions are used to describe the unexplained portion of inter-individual variability and and at this point now this notion of inter-individual variability even though it was unexplained I saw it as less of a nuisance item but as potentially something of interest uh, when you, one started thinking about treating patients uh, so that was kind of the first step towards uh, uh, towards thinking about, uh, sorry, I got myself distracted there, you know, thinking about the use of probability in these models and seeing it as something more than a nuisance. Uh, and But even then, I, you know, tended to, con to still view residual variability as more of a nuisance than as an integral component of the model. But what we'll see today and what really made it click for me is to start looking at things like categorical and count data and realizing that I couldn't view residual variation any longer as a nuisance element. Uh, I really had to view it as, as you know, I really view that as a key component of the model. Uh, as a result, a probabil probabilistic perspective became far more useful in thinking about this. Uh, let's see, I see things coming up here. Uh, what have I got here? Uh, well, Zhao Hu, I see you've got a couple of questions here. Uh, those are kind of, I think, specific to, to you here. Why don't I catch those as an aside, um, you know, after afterwards here. Uh, you were asking, I see, about the time required for final grade, and I'm sure we can probably accommodate there. Anyway. Okay, so so again, we're going to take a more probabilistic view of the problem. Excuse me while I find somebody's calling me here. Oh, okay. Let me come back to it. So that's what I'm going to do is view modeling then from a fairly probabilistic point of view. And, and what we find then in the context we're going to be working with is the likelihood function is is the mathematical expression of of that kind of a perspective then on the models. So let, let's go ahead and start with a concept here. We're going to start with the notion that the value of some potential future measurement is a random variable and we're going to call that potential future measurement y. Uh, now it's a random variable so it's not predictable with certainty and in fact, it's not predictable with certainty, even if we know all of the model parameters with certainty, uh, which we almost certainly don't uh, in most cases. Uh, and then the probabilities of different possible values of y then are described in terms of a probability distribution, which is what I'm showing here. So the way we read this expression then is y is distributed according to some probability distribution described by this function on the right here where I say P of Y given theta and X where this theta is a vector of model parameters and X is a vector of covariates. Okay, Y, the little Y here right now, that's just our sort of variable within our function here. Okay, whereas the capital Y is our, is our random variable in interest. Now in the case where Y is a continuous random variable, then this P of Y given theta is a probability density function. If we're working in a uh, discrete context, so if Y is a discrete random variable, then our P of Y given theta and X then is just a probability function. So it takes on values of probability as opposed to probability density. So that's going to be our, our core component here we're going to be thinking about. 
And just to make it a little more concrete, let's take what will probably be a fairly familiar set of fairly familiar context for most of you. So suppose that that future measurement of interest is a plasma drug concentration at some time T following an IV bolus of drug where the pharmacometric, pharmacokinetics can be described by a one compartment model with a normally distributed re residual variation. So here we've got it written out uh, and we've got so our y here, our random variable, which represents a as yet unobserved uh, plasma concentration of drug, uh, is distributed uh, according to some probability density function uh, that depends upon a set of parameters which collectively represent the theta in the previous slide. So clearance volume and sigma squared then is our vector of parameter values. So that's sort of the theta from the previous thing. And then time and dose are our covariates. So that's collectively what represents our x uh, from the previous uh, previous page. And that probability density function, as I said here, it's normally distributed, so it's going to be uh, described in terms of a uh, normal density function with some uh, standard deviation sigma and a, a mean. In this case, the mean is our function describing the time course for a one compartment model IV bolus. So you can see here, so this what's what the C hat here, which is a function of time, dose, and our parameters, clearance, and volume. And finally, we get down to the more familiar part, to at least to the pharmacokineticists in the group, just your basic uh, equation for a single dose IV bolus with a one compartment model. So the whole idea here, uh, hopefully it got across, is I start out with the familiar, or actually I sort of start out with the unfamiliar and led to the familiar. So if you prefer, you can go the other way. We start out with our one compartment model, which describes our mean concentration time course, but then to actually describe observed concentrations, we need to incorporate some kind of a uh, probability distribution, which describes our random variable here, representing that as yet unobserved uh, plasma concentration. And again, so even if I know the values of clearance, volume, and sigma squared with certainty, I can't say that y would be some particular value. The best I can say is I can say what the probability is that y will fall within to some particular interval. Okay, let's take this uh, a little further. Now, um, now suppose I've actually observed a measured value that we'll call y obs here. So we're no longer talking about a random variable because we actually know its value. We've observed a particular value uh, and that's what that quantity is. And if we insert that observed value into our probability distribution function, we now refer to that function as a likelihood function. Now, it's actually the very same function that we had before. It's really the perspective that changes. Uh, because now, well, previously when we were looking at it as a probability density function or a probability function, we were usually thinking of this as being a, uh, a, a function of the you know the data or as you know the as yet unobserved data uh, you know as a function of the uh, you well know, I'm sorry it's a it was a function of the data given uh, the parameters and covariates well now we're going to turn it around a bit and once we plug in an observed value of y obs that's a known quantity uh, and I'm making a presumption here we know our covariates here. So now we have a function that describes the, that, well, it's a function that describes the parameters given the data. So we've just kind of turned, turned it around, but in fact it's the very same mathematical form for this function. It's just that it's now, uh, are you thinking of it more as a function of, of the parameters. Now, during our model development, we generally don't know the values of our parameters. 
and the whole idea here will be to use the observed data to estimate those parameters. Here. So again, we've got a situation where we have observed data. We know that. We know the covariates. We don't know the parameters, and we want to estimate that given our, our, our data and parameters. And we argue then that the likelihood function contains information about what those parameter values might be. And during the course, we're going to be talking about two different approaches that exploit that likelihood function uh, to estimate our, our parameters here, our theta. Uh, the first one I'll mention here is going to be the maximum likelihood estimation approach uh, to estimating the parameters, and the other will be using Bayesian statistical analysis uh, to estimate the model parameters. But in both cases, they leverage this likelihood function in order to try and discover information about what those parameter values are. So let's talk about maximum likelihood first. Uh, and in particular, let's start out again with starting from the more familiar. We'll start with maximum likelihood in the case where we have continuous data. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and apply it to that one compartment model example. And let's suppose you observe plasma drug concentrations on two occasions. So and we're keeping it simple right now. Let's assume we're talking about one individual and we're observing concentrations on two different at two different times following a single IV bolus dose. So again, simple case. Uh, the resulting likelihood function uh, for that case then, we've written it out here. So again, it looks lengthy because now we've got our theta is now made up of these three parameters, clearance volume and sigma squared. We've got our observed data, which consists of two data points here, yobs one and two. And then we've got our covariates here, time one, time two, and dose. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption that uh, these two observations are, uh, are independent, uh, or that the random variables that we see on them are independent given uh, the parameters and so on. And in that case, the likelihood is just a product of the individual likelihoods for those two data points. So on the right-hand side, if we ignore the product term here, we have the same equation I had before for, the, uh, for our one compartment model case. But now I've got two different times. I've got a y-obs one and two. And so I multiply those two together. Again, I can substitute in my uh, normal density function here because I've assumed that uh, I've got normal residual variation. And again, my c hat function here is the same good old one compartment model with uh, uh, well, one compartment model with and uh, with single for a single bolus. And in general, with that can actually be extended then for pretty much any number of observations. So suppose I have instead of two, I've got n observations uh, here. So, so suppose I've got n observations described by a normal distribution uh, where the mean is some function f of x theta here of our parameters and covariates. I can write out the overall likelihood then uh, as a product of the individual likelihoods. Again, I'm assuming that the uh, uh, that the that these are independent conditioned on the uh, you know on our covariates here, and and again I can plug in my normal density and we have. Uh, and we have your no normal density on the right-hand side. We just multiply all those things together. And, of course, then the question is, okay, now what do I do with that? Well, under the using maximum likelihood principles, uh, we would get a maximum likelihood estimate for our theta by finding the value of theta that maximizes this function. So we have to find some method that allows us to explore uh, you know, maybe different values of, of theta here uh, to find out uh, find out the uh, what's the optimal value. And I just realized I got a little bit sloppy here uh, because actually sigma squared should actually be part of the of the theta also here. So it's really the theta term here as well as the the sigmas that we would want to find the the joint values that maximize that function. And that's the whole concept underlying the maximum likelihood uh, estimation process.
Uh, and then this just comments that rather than maximize the likelihood dire directly, uh, many maximum likelihood algorithms instead minimize the transformation of minus two times the log uh, of the likelihood. Uh, and this just writes that out for uh, for the case we just talked about here, uh, where I'm writing out minus two times the log of the likelihood, uh, doing the math. Of course, by taking the log, the products become sums. Uh, and sort of break out some of the terms here and notice that uh, over here you have a weighted sum of squares showing up in the right hand term which gives which shows you something about the relationship between maximum likelihood and uh, and and least squares estimation and that for some context they they give you the they give you equivalent estimates and basically when you're working with something like non-mem for uh, for continuous data uh, where you've got uh, in this case this would correspond to a normal residual variation um, where it's uh, where you've used an additive uh, residual error uh, this is basically what you're doing is under the hood it's working with minus two times the likelihood uh, minus two times the log of the likelihood, and it's minimizing uh, that quantity uh, to to get the estimates. Okay, so that's that's kind of still somewhat perhaps in familiar territory, other than you may or may not have in the past looked at it in quite as probabilistic a terms as this. But now, how do we adapt the same concept to you know our so-called odd type? data in here and that's what I want to talk about next uh, in particular we'll talk about binary data and it turns out once we sort of talk about this in terms of the likelihood as opposed to maybe starting out from square one just talking more heuristically about things like um, uh, least squares estimates uh, once we start talking about the likelihood the concept translates pretty readily to our so-called odd type data so let's again let's go binary data so first of all most often binary data is used to represent the occurrence or non-occurrence of an event there's probably other places where it might fit but that that's the, probably the most typical uh, sort of situation and we would use numerical values like 1 and 0 to represent those two possible outcomes for example you might use 1 to mean that it happened and 0 for it didn't happen uh, and that would be fairly typical. And suppose we want to model the current, you know, suppose we want to model the occurrence of maybe a particular adverse event, a uh, fairly common place where we encounter this kind of modeling. So let's start with just one patient uh, and one possible event. So we're going to let the random variable y here represent uh, the possible adverse event occurrence. Oh, I'm sorry, the Y will represent, um, let's see, where are we going? Okay, I can't read my own sentences here. Okay, so uh, random variable Y, it's representing possible AE occurrences, and if, uh, if that AE occurs, we would set that to 1 uh, if the AE occurs, and we'll set it to 0 if it doesn't. And that just turns out to be a Bernoulli trial that's modeled uh, according to a relationship we see down here. So we've got y is distributed according to some probability function here. Uh, and that probability function in here is simply uh, a one particular probability value, which I just called p sub ae, uh, when y equals 1. And it, so that's for the case where the event occurred. And the probability that the event did not occur is just the complement of that, 1 minus PAE. Uh, so that corresponds to y equals 0. Uh, and here, no, notice I've written this as being a possible function of parameters and covariates here again. Uh, another way that this commonly gets written uh, in a sense, it's almost more of a trick, but it's a handy trick for writing it out in a, uh, when you actually have to write out the, the likelihood. So the top one implies something like an if-then-else construct. Instead, you can do it as a simple multiplication like this. And you can see the trick here is just that notice that when y 
equals 1, well, then you get P raised to the 1, so you just get the PAE. Uh, and in that case, if Y equals 1, this would become 0, and 1 minus PAE raised to 0 would just be 1, so you just get PAE, which is equivalent to the first line here, and the similar pattern in the case where Y equals 1. I'm sorry, Y equals 0. Um, so that's that's a basic model then for our, our binary case like that where we have maybe just one possible observation per individual. Uh, and let's make it more concrete. Let's actually take some numbers here. And let's suppose we observe whether or not an adverse event occurs in 100 patients in some dose-response study, and these are the results. So you can see we've got placebo plus three different doses here, 10, 20, and 40 milligrams per day. Let's suppose we've got an equal number of patients per group, 25 per group, and here you've got the number of patients in whom those uh, adverse events have occurred. So you can see it's going up with dose from 5 for placebo up to 20 for the highest dose. So let, let's go ahead and try modeling that. And as a first pass here, let's uh, model the probability of an adverse event in the ice patient as a function of dose according to what we term a linear logistic model. And that's this guy right here. Uh, the linear part refers to the right-hand side here. So we've just got a uh, model which describes uh, something in terms of a just an intercept plus a slope times the dose. And on the left-hand side, we have some transformation of our probability term here. And in particular, it's a logit transformation. Uh, and the logit transformation is commonly used to transform uh, data between the range of probability, which goes from 0 to 1, to the entire real line. So here we've got the definition here. So a logit of p here is just the log of the quantity p over 1 minus p. Uh, and this function is, is restricted in the sense that it, uh, p has to be in the range 0 to 1, but the resulting value, the logit of p, can take on values anywhere from minus infinity to infinity, in other words, the whole real line. And in particular, the logit of 0 would be minus infinity, and the logit of 1 would be plus infinity. Uh, similarly, you can talk about the inverse of the logit, so here we've got the inverse logit function, which is, you know, if you solve this, you'll get that it comes out to e to the x over 1 plus e to the x, or you can write it like it is on the right-hand side as 1 over e to the minus x plus 1. And in this case, x can take on any value uh, on the real line. So anyway, it's a way to transform between those two spaces from the 0, 1 to the whole real line space. Uh, and also a comment here, this inverse logit, some people like to refer to that as, as an expert function in here. So in the same sense that the logit is an extension of the log function, they think of the inverse logit as being an extension of the exponential function. Okay, so this is our your sort of your first look here at logistic regression, if you like, because we've got a linear logistic model. That's what we're going to use for this example. Uh, and so the likelihood for that particular patient then, uh, we can see we're writing it out just like we had it. Again, it's the same function as before, uh, but now we're plugging in an observed value for y, so we talk about it as the likelihood instead of our probability function, and you've got that same uh, function that we described before for our Bernoulli trials. But now to apply that to our 100 patients, uh, and again, we're going to assume that uh, the observations in each patient are independent of the others, so we can describe the likelihood by taking the product over all 100 patients. As you see here, so our total likelihood, uh, you can see on the right-hand side here, by taking the product of all those individual uh, likelihood functions. Uh, and again, in this case, our, the value of theta that maximizes this function then is our maximum likelihood estimate. And that's, again, the, that's the basic idea then on doing linear logistic regression uh, in a maximum likelihood context. Uh, and for this particular example, just to 
uh, make it slightly more concrete. I've actually plotted here uh, the likelihoods. Uh, so what you're looking at, let me step back. I see I should have called those theta 0 and theta 1. I think up here I called them theta 0. Yeah, sorry. Think of this as being theta 1 and theta 2 here. I see I wasn't consistent. I need to change that because uh, here I numbered them wrong. But you can see we've got theta 1, which I believe is our intercept uh, here, uh, you know, going from minus 0 0.5 to minus 2.5, uh, and then our slope here going from 0 to, oh, what is it, going up to about 0.15, and you can see it goes, you know, we've got something that looks at least roughly like a bivariate normal, goes up to some peak, and that peak there then, which gives you the two values, theta 1 and theta 2, where the values of theta 1 and theta 2 at that peak then would be our maximum likelihood estimate. And over on the right-hand side, you can see that on a contour plot, and I've actually identified them here. So you've got the maximum likelihood estimate for, for our intercept would be minus 1.54, and for our slope of 0.072. And that's the whole basic idea then underlying our, our maximum likelihood estimate for this. Let's see, where are we? I'm just looking at the time. Let me actually take a uh, quick breather here, see if I've got any uh, any questions at this point. This is about the point where we're going to uh, actually transition off uh, and, uh, and come back on Thursday. Uh, and in fact, what I'll plan on doing here in this Thursday, uh, I'll continue... Uh, with the our, this background information, as well as spend some time uh, showing you the ropes of using uh, using the Windows uh, our uh, our remote Windows server, uh, and probably at least show you uh, an initial sort of uh, an initial example using WinBugs. I think we'll have enough time to do a little bit of that. As I say, any any questions before we ring off? And if you do have questions that for some reason we don't get to or you think of later, again, you've got uh, either the forums or email as a uh, as a means for uh, uh, for passing those on. Let's see. Well, I do have a question here. Is there material to learn wind bugs like a manual? Uh, well, I guess a couple of things. I, I actually was making an assumption that it was a prerequisite to have uh, some experience working with wind bugs, so I wasn't going to be going through um, the basics on that, but there is. Uh, WinBugs itself has uh, has a help file in it, and uh, one particular nice one particularly nice thing about WinBugs is it has uh, quite a large number of examples uh, that if you look in the uh, uh, under the help menu, you'll see a number of examples listed there. Hmm. Okay. I see I was getting a quote from Joe that apparently what was posted is that prior experience with Bayesian modeling with wind bugs is desirable but not required. Hmm, I need to take a look at that because that was a term that was used. Uh, well, anyway, we won't go into that in too much detail now. I'll figure that out. If that's the way it's posted, I may uh, point you to some other resources as a means for dealing with that. Uh, anyway, so there, there is that, and I'll, I'll take a look and see if there's any other uh, easy resources because of course we give um, 
we have a couple of different courses that we do for that. The uh, uh, there's one particular quick course which is either done as an on-site one-day course or sort of the equivalent on a uh, on a independent study basis on on the website. So that that's another way to go after that uh, that material. But I'll see. Actually, maybe I should ask. Um, uh, in here, if um, to get a a reading from from folks here. Actually, this is where I should learn how to use the poll on this. Is to find out how many people need an introduction uh, to wind bugs. Uh, actually, why don't we try to think what the best bet is here? Uh, if you're still on the line, go ahead and give me an indication on whether you do need an introduction to wind bugs, uh, and we might take a session to at least do a real quick and dirty. Uh, I also see, Andreas, you were asking, are we going to be using Windbugs Vanilla or with R? Uh, we will be using it in conjunction with R. In particular, I'll be using R to Windbugs uh, as the means for kind of gluing things together. Uh, so we'll be uh, basically using R for any data management and uh, and subsequent analysis of the Windbugs results, and we'll be f and we'll be running bugs by um, by using R to win bugs to launch it. Okay, let's see. Okay, got a mixed bag here in terms of uh, what the needs are showing so far. I'll uh, see what we can see what we can work up here, because uh, certainly if the uh, if the materials that brought you to the class said that it wasn't required, we'll uh, uh, I'll see what I can do to fill fill something in. Uh, I may rethink exactly the specifics of what we cover as a result of that on Thursday and maybe the following Monday here uh, to make sure we cover something. Another possibility is uh, if I identify, if if it's say less than half the people or something like that, I may, uh, we might even try to schedule a uh, another session to specifically uh, do an intro to wind bugs. Okay, well, actually, I'm going to uh, uh, let you loose then uh, and uh, and plan on talking to you again on Thursday. Uh, if I think of any um, good ways to direct you to some quick resources, too, for, for wind bugs as another alternative for self-study, uh, I'll see if maybe I can post something for you uh, on, the, on the course website. In the meantime, I uh, look forward to talking to you again on Thursday. Bye for now.